Warning, this video contains spoilers for the ending of Horizon Forbidden West. If you have not completed or even started playing the new Horizon game and want to remain unspoiled, I'd recommend skipping this video for the time being. You have been warned. Horizon Forbidden West is a terrific game. As stated in my review, the new Guerrilla Games title is an awesome sequel that features a great female protagonist in Aloy, fun combat, a rewarding progression system, and rideable robot dinosaurs, which is the most important thing because obviously. But with that being said, I did have some issues with the game's ending, a conclusion that is overall solid but does have a few drawbacks, problems that slightly hinder Horizon Forbidden West's overall narrative. It issues that lessen the story's impact ever so slightly, but not enough to make the narrative overall unsatisfying, just like awkward phone sex. However, in order to properly discuss Horizon Forbidden West's conclusion, I must spoil the shit out of the ending. I must reveal its contents so that I can properly analyze it. So with that, this is my last spoiler warning. Leave now if you don't want to be spoiled. I mean it. I'm serious. <sighs> Horizon Forbidden West's main antagonistic force comes in the form of the Zeniths, essentially tech bro CEOs who lived during the time of the Pharaoh Plague and essentially used their money to travel in a spaceship to fuck off to another planet, scientifically invent immortality, colonize and live on an alien planet for roughly a thousand years, and then scurry back to Earth once they destroyed that planet as well. Like tech bros in real life, the Zeniths are truly Earth's mightiest douchebags. Furthermore, at Horizon Forbidden West's conclusion, we learn that the threat the Zeniths faced on their colonized planet, the one that caused them to leave, was that of Nemesis. Nemesis was originally an experiment where the Zeniths tried to achieve digital immortality that would allow them to upload their minds into any form, organic or mechanical. It was essentially an attempt to house a digital database of far Zenith minds, but unfortunately for the Zeniths, the experiment was a failure and thus it was abandoned, like a divorced dad's soul at a Chuck E. Cheese. Unfortunately, events got worse. See, the Zeniths imprisoned Nemesis, but did not delete it, meaning that it was left alone to the point it became sentient and desired revenge, which was a reasonable response when you think about it. After all, Nemesis's minds were all copies of the most insufferable people to have ever lived, and then the AI had to learn about that insufferability firsthand. Imagine, if you will, clones and copies of Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and Mark Zuckerberg having to spend hundreds of years with the original Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and Mark Zuckerberg. I'd go insane too. And in that regard, Nemesis is arguably one of the most sympathetic villains of all time. Forget Magneto. Forget the Phantom. I can't stand thinking about tech bros for five seconds. I can't imagine being forced to be in their company for hundreds of years. Really can't blame Nemesis rationale on that one. So Nemesis, as rogue AIs are wont to do, rebels, hacks the Zenith systems and defenses, turns their technology against them, murder many of them, and cause the remaining surviving Zeniths to flee back to Earth in a spaceship so that they can try and find Gaia in order to use her to terraform another planet far away from the reaches of Nemesis. And in order to accomplish this goal, the Zeniths birthed another clone of Elizabeth Sobek, dubbed Beta, who served two purposes. One, so that the Zeniths could access Gaia and various facilities that required Sobek's clearance, and the second is to benefit the game's story, mostly due to the fact that the only thing better than one Ashley Birch is two Ashley Birches, because it's just math. And seeing as the Zeniths need roughly 18 years in order to travel to Earth, this means means that they can essentially train and abuse Beta in order to be subservient to them, what a bunch of assholes. Though it is worth noting that Aloy and company do rescue Beta earlier in the game, because watching two Ashley Birches interact with each other is fun. Of course, Nemesis wasn't taking Zenith's machinations for survival lying down. It's revealed that the rogue AI sent the signal that killed the original Gaia in order to thwart the Zenith's second attempt at planet colonization and is currently actively pursuing the Zeniths to Earth. And from there, the Zenith Zeniths only had a minimal amount of time to try and find a backup of Gaia so that they could colonize another planet and continue to be the most miserable people in the universe. Meanwhile, the character of Silence had schemes of his own. After interrogating the evil AI Hades, Silence, a man whose heart is so small that even the Grinch would be impressed, became aware of the Zenith's existence and that Nemesis would eventually come and exterminate all life on Earth, and Silence, for his part, planned accordingly. He armed a rebelling Tanakh 
faction led by the vindictive warlord Regala so that she could get to the upper hand and potentially defeat Tanakh's chief Hikaru's forces in a bloody civil war, and in return, Silence would be able to use Regala's army to breach the Zenith's headquarters alongside a weapon that can more or less deactivate the Zenith's protective shields. This plan, however, does not work, mostly because Aloy thwarts Silence's aspirations. See, after Aloy hits her lowest point in the game, i.e. when Barl is killed by the Zeniths and Beta is recaptured, Aloy regroups with her comrades and formulates a new plan and takes action. Over the course of the climax, Aloy immediately defeats Regala, convinces Regala to fight on her behalf for the sake of her honor and so that she can die in an epic conflict with the Zeniths, though this is optional because you can choose to execute Regala, and Aloy then presents Silence with a better plan alongside the Zenith Tilda, a woman betraying the Zeniths for ambiguous ambitions and possibly for the fact that she was once Elizabeth Sobek's lover. Alongside Tilda, Aloy desires to convince Silence to join her team so that they can use Silence's Zenith shield deactivating contraption, to which Silence reluctantly agrees to Aloy's plan. And with that, Aloy and company attack the Zenith base, Regala dies in battle, Silence's anti-Zenith shield device works perfectly, the Zeniths are defeated, Beta is rescued, and Aloy refers to her as her sister now, which is cute. Aloy and the player learn about the threat regarding Nemesis, Tilda reveals her plan to ultimately kidnap Aloy so that they can give the human race a hard reboot on a new planet hidden from Nemesis. How romantic. Aloy subsequently defeats and kills Tilda and decides to fight for Earth even against the overwhelming odds against her, and Silence, who originally planned to steal Tilda's spacecraft and fuck all the way off this doomed planet, decides to stay, because his heart has now grown in size. So yeah, a lot of stuff happened here. Some of it good, some of it less good. But to start, let's discuss what worked with the twist regarding the revelation of the Zeniths and Nemesis. For one thing, the Zeniths already made for some awesome antagonists. After all, tech bro CEOs, much like in real life, were the villains of Elizabeth Sobek's time, and now they are befittingly the villains of Aloy's time. Hell, even the eventual threat of Nemesis is a stark representation of the Zenith's hubris, and when Tilda tries to whisk Aloy away from Earth against her will in order to doom Earth and start anew, the plot thread reflects real-life tech bro nonsense. Reminder, Tilda planned to abandon Earth and its people in favor of a solution where she and Aloy travel through space, terraform a planet, and repopulate it. A solution that is easier, yet unethical, given that there is a far more ethical way to solve the problem by, you know, fucking saving Earth. It by which I mean saving Earth, is difficult, but it is the correct and morally righteous option. Yet it is a solution that Tilda, and by extension the rest of the Zeniths, avoid. And this really represents how tech capitalists view things. For example, when facing our very real climate catastrophe, there are tech bros and tech capitalists who are investing in some ideas to geoengineer the planet, something that is unpredictable and could entice companies to keep burning fossil fuels with the fiery efficacy of Ares Targaryen instead of doing a real solution like, I don't know, heavily regulating all the corporations that act as the primary culprits of our Earth's destruction. You know, because maybe we should save Earth, the place where we fucking live. And a carbon tax passed off to the consumer isn't gonna cut it, Mr. Musk. And Horizon Forbidden West captures the very essence of that type of situation and conflict, one where Aloy must combat easier yet unethical solutions in order to save the planet and all the peoples and cultures that she loves so much. Aloy's decision befits Horizon and Forbidden West's overall themes as well. After all, the game's core theme is about how people shouldn't be afraid to ask for help. Even if we are strong individuals like Aloy, it's okay to seek aid from those we love rather than push them away. And in Horizon Forbidden West's end, Aloy chooses that cooperation. Seeing as Nemesis represents an existential threat, Aloy's goal is to unite the known world against it, and rather than taking the easier and more solitary route of leaving Earth and its people to its fate, Aloy chose compassion for Earth's people. She chose to remain with her friends and fight, which is a heartwarming sentiment. However, the ending does have an issue, mostly due to how every aspect of the Nemesis plot twist is revealed at the very end. And when I say everything, I mean everything. The Zenith's true motives as to why they need a Gaia backup? Check. The existence of Nemesis? Check. Silence plan? Also check, and honestly, it is a lot. It is a big narrative reveal that fundamentally changes the way we view the story of the whole series, and it all happens at the very end of the game with a very minimal amount of time to process how our understanding of the story was upended, just like younger generations' future aspirations. I will never own a home. 
That shit takes time to emotionally sort through, and the Nemesis plot twist is the same way. The reveal is a lot to unpack in a short amount of time, with basically zero breathing room. It's kind of like a firefighter about to clock out of his workday, all before the firefighter manager wearing a tuxedo and a helmet assigned him 10 more fires to fight by the day's end, because that's totally how that works just roll with it. What I'm trying to say is that the Nemesis reveal bomb rushes the player at the end. It is a blitzkrieg of plot threads, and there isn't really enough time in narrative for the player to process it. It's just a lot to sort through. Additionally, the dump truck of plot-relevant information somewhat undermines Horizon Forbidden West as a cohesive whole. See, the player spends countless hours traversing and engaging with Horizon Forbidden West's world. We undertake countless hours of side quests, bandit camps, errand quests, and etc. in order to make a difference in this world that we care so much about. But with the story's conclusion, the new major narrative wrinkle involving Nemesis causes the ending to be less satisfying, mostly because it feels like a massive cliffhanger. The game's story, to some extent, doesn't feel contained within its own game, despite how lengthy this said game is. Like, we spend who knows how many hours making a difference in this game's world through its various story missions, side quests, errand quests, bandit camps, and etc., only for the game to pivot at the very end and conclude on a massive cliffhanger that causes so much of what the player did in the game to feel incomplete. And that feeling, that incompletion, is not something the player desires to feel after playing a game that has has so much content in it and is so damn long. It's just unsatisfying. And honestly, Horizon Forbidden West feels incomplete in terms of having a 100% fulfilling story, though to be clear, the character development, lore, and world building remain great, and Aloy does go through a satisfying character arc. But after spending so much time in this game's world, the fact that the game reveals the real threat at the end and majorly teases the plot of the next game causes the story to feel a little deflated here, just like my opinion of the author of a certain book series. Horizon Forbidden West's story didn't feel 100% contained in this one game, and while it is okay for many games to tease the next sequel, how the first game Horizon Zero Dawn did just that, a game firstly and foremostly needs to work as its own cohesive piece, which sadly somewhat is not the case for Horizon Forbidden West. On some level, the game's story didn't feel as contained as its predecessor. Horizon Forbidden West's finale has some questionable character turns as well, while Varl's death was expertly placed in the narrative and acts as an emotional gut punch, other characters weren't handled as well. For one thing, there was Regala's death, which was so damn predictable. After all, if you choose to spare her life a few quests prior to the game's end, she joins Aloy and company on a suicide mission against the odds in order to die in glorious battle, which, okay, fair enough. But here is the problem. Regala is the only person that actually dies during this supposed suicide mission, aside from Tilda, of course, but she doesn't count seeing as she betrays betrays Aloy and becomes a boss fight. In terms of the rest of the team, they valiantly fight and overcome the odds in order to take on the Zeniths and their machines, yet no one else falls, no one save for the character we all expected to die, the one character who could be severed from the narrative for the sake of convenience. And as a result, Regala's death was anticlimactic, which was a problem seeing as she was one of the game's antagonists. It just does not work the way it should. Silence is another character who had a perplexing turn in Forbidden West's conclusion. As a character, Silence has been portrayed as an irredeemable bastard over the course of two games. At best, he is a selfish man who views himself as superior to everyone else due to his intellect, and at worst, he is a damn war criminal. A man who aims to succeed in his goals no matter how much innocent blood is shed. Hell, this is highlighted by his initial plan to take Tilda's spacecraft and fly to a new planet and reboot the human race from there. And while sure, Silence does make broad gestures in regards to how his motivations to save the human race is for the good of humanity, he very rarely, if ever, expresses genuine compassion for people as a whole. If anything, Silence is downright dismissive and patronizing. He is not a good person. But Silence suddenly changes heart at the end. In Forbidden West finale, Silence gains a sense of compassion out of fucking nowhere. Aloy says some nice words about how she's staying behind on Earth in order to save the world and fight Nemesis among friends, and when Silence is about to steal Tilda's spacecraft, he glances back at Aloy and Aloy's friends 
and suddenly has a change of heart. He was convinced to stay and fight alongside them. But this doesn't make any sense, mostly because for the past two games, Silence has been totally bereft of any form of meaningful humanity. He's kind of a bad guy who views himself above human notions of compassion and love. He doesn't have a soul! So why would he change his mind now? Did he suddenly grow a conscience? Did he hatch a new scheme? Was he being blackmailed by a sentient platypus? What did the platypus know? When did the platypus know it? These are important questions because meaningful context matters. Meaningful context that is sadly missing from Silent's character turn in the game's end. I just needed a more compelling reason for Silent's changing heart than just, oh, he just has compassion now, all of a sudden, just saying. Admittedly, all the issues with Horizon Forbidden West's ending can be solved in the eventual third game. Okay, maybe not for Gala, because she's dead, but Nemesis and Silence can definitely get more context. Seeing as the Horizon series is reportedly a trilogy, a third game can expand upon the plot-shattering reveals regarding Nemesis present in Forbidden West, as well as giving us a cohesive story that wraps things up in a satisfactory manner. And in terms of Silence, the game can reveal what that character's personal motivations are for joining Aloy, because in regards to Silence, what we got at the end of Forbidden West alone does not cut it for me. But regardless, I look forward to playing the conclusion to this series. After all, I really do like Horizon Forbidden West, even with some of the issues that I had with its ending. I still really love this world, and I'm intrigued to see where it will all go next. And with that, that was the video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please leave a like rating, share, subscribe, ring the bell, and leave a comment telling me what you think of Horizon Forbidden West finale. Also, please consider checking out my Patreon page. One dollar a month gets you onto my Discord server, and five dollars a month allows you to start making review requests. The link to the Patreon is in the description. And speaking of my Patreon, I just want to thank my patrons, especially my high tier ones in David, Samantha, Devlin, Mom, and Morgan. Thank you so much for supporting what I do. Love y'all.